Thank you very much, Fabio, and um, welcome, welcome everyone to uh, to our uh, international technical webinar. Today we are going to um, to um, together to cover how to transition to nutrition sensitive and sustainable food systems. Everybody talks about uh, sustainability and sustainable food systems, and the webinar today is to try to uh, give us some idea about how we do this transition to nutrition sensitive uh, and sustainable food systems. So let me first introduce myself. I am Christina Petraki and I head the FAO eLearning Academy. So the FAO eLearning Academy uh, has organized this uh, webinar together with um, Agrinium, uh, together with the United Nations um, uh, Economic and Social um, Commission for Asia and Pacific. Uh, also with Future Food Institute, and we are extremely uh, pleased today to have also with us uh, the United Nations Scaling Up Nutrition uh, Movement uh, partners. So um, the, the webinars that we organize, so we organize series of webinars during the year, uh, cover the thematic areas of our global challenges. And all of these thematic areas are also covered in the courses that the FAO eLearning Academy offers, and that uh, will be um, mentioned to you towards the end of the webinar. Um, so we, today, we are very pleased to have a very rich program with um, high-level experts. So we have uh, with us uh, um, our colleague from FAO, um, Dia Sanu, who is a nutrition officer. We also have uh, with us uh, Leslie Macheka, who is the director for research um, uh, in uh, Macondera University of Agricultural uh, Sciences and Technology uh, in Zimbabwe. We also have with us uh, Tonde Matsungo, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics, University of Zimbabwe. And also, uh, we are very pleased to have with us also Aurélie Zunino, who uh, is um, from SUPAGRO. Uh, so it is a Paris Institute of uh, Technology for Life, Food, and Environmental Sciences. So without uh, further ado, I will give the floor to uh, uh, my colleague Dia Sanu. And I wanted to mention that all, uh, uh, all speakers will have 15 minutes. And the participants, you can all ask questions uh, using the, the Q&A uh, tab. And uh, we will, after the presentation, we will have a Q&A session where, where your questions will be addressed and where there will be a discussion about uh, uh, the, 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 the questions that have been posed during the presentations. So without uh, any further ado, Dia, uh, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good morning, um, everybody. Thank you, Christina. I hope you are able to see my screen. Yes, yes we are. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy to, to contribute to this um, technical webinar with a topic um, on our experience in, in capacity building in time of COVID using resources from FAO e Academy and also FAO um, toolkit for improving nutrition through agriculture uh, and food system. So what I will be sharing is um, a work we have done with the support of colleagues from headquarters, from country offices, as well as um, uh, consultants. So um, for this, this 15 minute, I will be quickly introducing the, the topic, why is it important to transition to a uh, nutrition sensitive, healthy, um, nutrition sensitive agriculture and food system, um, or the framework of the capacity building initiative in our sub-regions. And we will take the specific examples of one blended um, initiative we have done recently, and we will discuss um, the challenges and uh, lesson learned from this, um, this, this experience so as to inform uh, potentially other, um, other activities uh, in the same line. So 
when we talk about food system, it is important to understand why do we want to transition? What is wrong with, with the food system? So the recent um, uh, reports on the state of food and nutrition uh, globally suggests that about 690 million people are still undernourished. Uh, for children under the year or age of five, we still have 50 uh, children who are wasted. One out of three adults is overweight. So, uh, or either overweight or obese. Another aspect of our food system, we have about 30 to 40% of the food produced globally that are wasted. So while we still have 690 million people undernourished, the world is producing 1.5 times enough food than, than we need it, right? But another a, a, a report from FAO, UNICEF, and other stakeholders still suggests that we still have 3 billion people who cannot afford healthy diet in the world. And another aspect of our food system is that one third of the harmful green gas emission globally is due to our food system. So it is really critical that we try to reduce the impact of this, um, the negative impact of the food system on, our, on, on the people and on the, uh, on, on, on the planet. So um, now when we talk about food system, we need to transition. I mentioned before that we need to transition to a um, sustainable food system. It's mean food system that are inclusive, that are sustainable, that are environmental friendly, that are resilient, but also uh, that are efficient and most importantly in link with this topic that provide nutritious and safe uh, diet in, 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 in the world. So um, for that, what do we need? We need, um, uh, we need food system champions who can then, um, who can advocate for system thinking for our food system. It's not a one single program, it's not one project. It's, we need to have a food system thinking. We need to understand what are the performance, what are the trends, what are the, um, the impact of the current food system in our in, 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 in the diet. We need also to have a multi-stakeholder dialogue. I think this is ongoing now. And we need to have an enabling environment for the transformation of our food system. And in line with today's topic, we need to have capacity, what we call multi-level capacity for the transformation to our uh, sustainable uh, food systems. Um, and, also, I'm not going to spend much time on this, uh, this figure. It seems very complex, but um, yeah, I'm not going to spend much time on it. Uh, when we talk about food system, what are we talking about? We are talking about a complex and dynamic system, right? So that includes resources, input, production, transport, a number of activities, as well as stakeholders. And the high-level panel of experts of the Committee of Food Security distinguish um, three elements. The food system drivers, um, including the biophysical, innovation, political, social, cultural factors that affect uh, um, the, 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 the different component of the food system. We have then the four component, the production, the food supply chain, the um, food environment, the consumer behavior, the diet, and all this should lead to nutrition and positive nutrition and health outcomes. And this outcome also have a potential to also affect the other aspect of the food system, notably the drivers. And of course, we have the outcomes of the, of the food systems that are the diet, healthy diet. We are uh, looking at, and when we talk about diet, it's not only about the quantity, but it's also about the quality, the diversity, as well as the safety of, of the diet. So the last um, uh, element I mentioned about what is needed to transform this food system, it's about capacity. 
So an FAO mandate, one of the mandate of FAO is really to strengthen the capacity of member states to design and implement nutrition sensitive programs and policies. And in this regard, the organization have developed a, um, a, a, a capacity de development roadmap, which have, which target three different dimension, enabling environment organization level and individual level capacity. And also consider policy and normative aspect, knowledge for evidence, uh, implementation aspect, as well as partnership and, 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 and collaboration. And of course, in terms of tar target, it's target different level of stakeholders, which I'm not going to spend more time on. This is just to provide you the background of, of, of um, the example I will be uh, presenting. So in our sub-regional level here, which is a, um, a technical app of FAO for Eastern Africa covering nine countries and also a liaison office to Africa Union and United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. We also have a, a, a nutrition support strategy in which capacity development is a key. So we have started capacity development activities at country level since 2019. Unfortunately, the 2020, it was stopped a, a, a little bit and back. We tried to adapt uh, the contents and, and start recently. So we do individual capacity strengthening. We also have activities that aim at strengthening the enabling environment, for example, we support the creation and we are still supporting the running of the Eastern African Parliamentarian Alliance for Food Security and Nutrition, under which six national alliances have been established and our, our members are receiving a number of advocacy and capacity building activities on annual basis. We also develop manuals uh, to train and to capacitate. We also have thematic guidance for nutrition, uh, um, men swimming both for FAO internal staff, as well as uh, um, uh, member state. We also support with, with uh, other division, the development of food and nutrition act or mod, uh, model law to strengthen the food security and nutrition environment. So coming back specifically this year, we have already conducted um, two, um, two workshop using the blended approach, but I will focus mainly on one, the uh, the one we did in um, in Eritrea, which uh, was kind of an adaptation of a three days, three to five days workshop. We have to adapt it through a blended model. What 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 do we call blended uh, model? So we had a face to face presentation by national stakeholders that focus mainly on the context and on specific topics such as the nutrition context, the national uh, framework and, 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 and other aspects. We also have virtual live session delivered by different experts from the sub-regional office, from headquarters, from our country offices, that building on the toolkits. I will show you later on what are the module we use based on the toolkit, FAO toolkit for nutrition sensitive agriculture, and we also have self-guided uh, learning, whereby we identify a number of relevant modules from the e-learning academy, which we assign to participants to take at the, the time they wish. So, and we also have a face-to-face -face, um, uh, group facilitation. So um, again, this is um, the theory of change we have for, for the capacity building uh, the capacity strengthening in Eritrea. It is built on the framework developed again under the roadmap of FAO. So basically we had a project and under this project, there is a number of nutrition related activities. And during the incept at the inception of this project, uh, it was clearly stated that the, um, um, they need a capacity building, not only for this project, but also to be able to design and implement nutrition sensitive program in the fishery sector, in the crop sector, in the livestock sector, and in the environment and livestock resources. So then the, um, um, the, the participants were 
at national level, we have a national technical committee, which is a multi-stakeholder body, and at sub-national level, key stakeholder involved in the project. So um, in terms of capacity assessment, we have a number of discussion. Again, the need was expressed during the inception of the project that this should be one of the first step for toward the implementation of the project. So we expect really to develop a common understanding and vision among stakeholders. And we also expect to develop individual skills and the confidence to implement not only the project, but also to design other projects. So we also have specific output and interventions. I'm not going again to spend much time on this. I think what is important for the topic is what we have done and how. So that uh, so we you these are the key modules that really guide the contents, and these are from the toolkit for nutrition sensitive agriculture and food system. They are all available for free on our website. So we have key recommendations. We have design nutrition sensitive agriculture and investment um, option for interventions and compendium for indicators. So for the e-learning academy. We also identify modules we feel are relevant that can be taken online at the time the participant want. So to be able to manage properly the time, one week before we start, two modules were assigned. And these modules are extremely comprehensive enough to cover at least 50% of what we want to cover during the training. So this, uh, 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 the one improving nutrition through agriculture and food system and design and monitor nutrition sensitive agriculture and food system programs. And the other three were then allocated uh, throughout the, 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 the workshop, most particularly in the afternoons. So in terms of what, uh, in terms of the programs, as I mentioned, the week before they have to take this, um, these uh, two activities, these uh, two modules, and then throughout they have also to uh, to complement the um, to throughout they have to take some of the modules. So when you go to the e-learning academy, this is how the 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 the, the design of the, the first page of the module look like. In Eritrea, internet is a big challenge, but the good thing is for us we had the possibility to download the module, the complete module to download it, to put in a memory stick and to distribute to all participants so that they can take the course at their, at their space in their office. So um, we did that and, but we have the e-learning also offer certification for in every single module completed. So when they want certification, they can they then can come back to FL office where there is a reliable uh, internet and then take the digital certification and get certified for the single individual module they have completed. Of course, there were also a complete a, a, another um, certificates of attendance for the whole. So we download, we distribute, and the good thing is that most of the participants complete um the 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 e-learning module the first two assigned module before they come to the workshop so and in terms of uh, structure to ensure that this is virtual it is online how do we ensure that people are not too bored and so most of the live session with experts were practically early in the morning when we start made maximum two hours we dealt with uh, the key presentations live from different experts around the world. And toward the lunchtime, when needed, we have facilitated group work. We did have few group work that was moved uh, in the afternoon, but most of the afternoon were really dedicated to self-learning, self-guided learning from the, um, the uh, e-learning -E academy. So what have we learned from, 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 from this experience is that really the e-learning academy module have been extremely useful. Uh, it's, it's really helped participants to come a little bit more aware of um, what, what, what should be covered and also with some basic knowledge which they didn't have before. And the downloaded version really and help us mitigate the challenge associated to internet connectivity and 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 other and other aspect. 
So we felt that it is cost effective, this approach, because we were about six experts in different areas. So if we have, we needed to have a face-to-face -to, -face to have all these but people there, we need to pay for their air, uh, for the transportation, uh, the accommodation, DSAs, which will have increased the cost of, of the training. So of course, it helped us also to leverage the expertise from experts. If it was a face-to-face, -face, all these experts will not be able to travel to Eritrea for sure. So because it was kind of mixed, we, we were able to have them on site and, and they were able to contribute. It also required, um, we also found that it require really a good person who can coordinate in the field, link the external to the internal, and, and also um, the person who is in field, if the person is not the lead facilitator, he needs to be prepared brief enough and participate in all step of the preparation to be sure that they understand the instruction. But for example, the um, facilitated group work, the key experts are not there to explain the, the instruction. So the person on site need really to understand this instruction. And we have seen the difference between Eritrea and Somaliland that this is a very critical key aspect. And in Eritrea particularly at the end of the, day, the workshop, they decided to create a technical working group, which is now supporting the implementation of the project. In terms of, of course, we did have a number of challenges. Uh, for example, we have to respect the social distancing measure. And because the office, the training was held, for example, in FL office that was very small, we have to split them in two rooms. And sometimes the connection, the technology, all the rooms were not um, hearing the information at the same pace. We, of course, we have some challenges with um, technology and because of the technology, the distance, it's, it's delay, uh, respecting the time was a bit um, uh, critical. Of also for, for the group work, so the group work instruction were not designed by the people who were in the field and sometimes they have to come back to the different experts waiting to seek clarification and go back to the group. Um, there was limited access to, um, to computers and of course, internet was, was, was a key. Um, internet issue was a key. And um, so, it's, in terms of planning, definitely it's, it's, it's require more, more time, additional time for planning, the logistic and many other aspects um, uh, to be success, successful. So in summary, um, based on what I show about the numbers before, if we need to transform our food system, if we don't, we will be having more malnutrition with related health causes while at the same time we'll have more food loss and harmful gas emission. And we believe that FAO strategies for nutrition and related capacity development roadmap provide really a good opportunity to strengthen capacity of member states and other stakeholders to support the food system transformation to our healthy diets. While the COVID forced us really to change the way of operation, it's also challenged us to, um, to innovate. And we think that uh, improving this approach, this blended uh, learning approach can be a good way to address some of the challenges uh, that uh, COVID have shown us. Uh, again, the e-learning academy modules is a very interest, interesting um, alternative. Um, and the fact that it's one single module uh, that is stand alone, you can select which you want based on the objective of your workshop. So we uh, really found that uh, the blended approach for us at least is a very cost effective and alternative way to uh, face to face capacity building in time of COVID. And um, we, we still have few capacity building workshops to come and we are hoping really to improve on it to be able to have the same result as face to face learning. <coughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dia, for this wonderful presentation. I think it was particularly useful to learn from your perspective also about these challenges and lessons learned 
when delivering capacity uh, developing activities and specific tools uh, at the sub-regional level. As you can see, there are about 10 questions already for you in the Q&A box, so uh, 11. I invite you to have a look while the other speakers will present. Uh, so then when we get to the Q&A moment, you can choose a couple and go ahead with a live answer. Then we will provide answers to all questions. So without any further ado, I now give the floor to Leslie Macheca, Director for Research, Innovation and Technology Transfer at Marondra University of Agricultural Sciences and Technology in Zimbabwe. He will present about climate change adaptation strategies and the nutrition nexus towards sustainable food, food systems. So Leslie, over to you. Thank you very much, Fabio. Yes, Thank you, Gia, for the presentation. And uh, greetings to all the um, participants and everyone who has joined uh, the webinar. Uh, like um, introduced, my name is Leslie Machega. I'm with Marondra University of Agriculture Sciences and Technology in Zimbabwe. So I'm going to present um, on climate change adaptation strategies and nutrition nexus and uh, towards sustainable food systems. So you'll find as we are talking about sustainable food um, systems, the issue of climate change is one big threat to the sustainable food systems. So I'm going to look especially from the angle of adaptation strategies. The impact of uh, climate change on nutrition, I think that um, have been uh, discussed a lot, but where the gap is, is on uh, the different mitigation and adaptation strategies that are put in place. They need to be nutrition sensitive. So my introduction, my uh, presentation is um, outlined as follows. I'll start with the background and introduction, climate change and nutrition ne uh, nexus. I'll talk about um, a conceptual framework that we are working on. Uh, that's uh, which will be the heart of my presentation. Then I'll give um, a conclusion. So you find the issue of um, climate change, um, adaptation to climate uh, change and variability is a requirement for future sustainability of food systems. In order to overcome the impact of climate change, we need to adapt. And um, that has an impact on uh, our food systems. And uh, different adaptation strategies have been employed by communities uh, for them to survive the harsh uh, climate change variabilities. And for example, in Zimbabwe, uh, over the past decade, there is an increased frequency of droughts and uh, of late harsh environmental conditions such as floods. So we really need to adapt. And uh, the different adaptation strategies uh, can have positive and negative impact on nutrition outcomes. So that's uh, very key. As we are, are programming, as we are introducing the different intervention strategies, uh, these adaptation strategies, we also need to make sure they do not have a negative impact on nutrition they should have a positive impact. So we need to um, customize them uh, to the environment in which we are implementing these intervention, interventions or the adaptation strategies. So therefore, the climate change adaptation strategies should be nutrition sensitive. So in order for us to have also sustainable um, food systems. Then I want to talk about the climate change and nutrition ne uh, nexus. So you find climate change has increased uh, or exacerbated the existing malnutrition problems in Southern Africa. And in Zimbabwe, we actually have uh, your malnutrition, um, undernutrition, overnutrition, and all these are uh, uh, even micronutrient deficiency. So climate change partly has contributed to this. And sustainable, resilient, climate resilient, and nutrient sensitive agriculture development is there fundamental and an integral to improving nutrition outcomes in the face of climate change. So this is one of uh, the frameworks that uh, I think um, some colleagues maybe who are in the field of nutrition or who have been following the issue of climate change, but on nutrition can uh, understand or have uh, knowledge about. So this is one of the frameworks uh, from uh, Tirado 2013, where it gives a comprehensive overview of um, climate change extremes, variability, and influence on nutrition outcomes. Basically, how do climate change influence uh, nutrition outcomes? 
So in um, this diagram framework will show you that um, there are three key determinants, household food access, maternal and uh, child care and feeding practices, and access to health services and environmental health. So all these are affected by climate change. But uh, you find there are several of these um, uh, frameworks. The previous uh, colleague also uh, showcased or talked about another framework also, which uh, is used to explain to explain the linkage between climate change and nutrition. But however, as we have been researching or looking into the issue of impact of climate change on nutrition, there is a lack of emphasis on the impact of um, the adapt different climate change adaptation strategies or mitigation strategies on nutrition outcomes. So we are just talking about uh, the different climate change adaptation strategies. For example, sometimes replacing, um, if I give an example of Zimbabwe, uh, replacing uh, maize or seal uh, with uh, um, small grains like sorghum, um, finger millet. But besides that, besides looking at uh, drought tolerant varieties, we should also look if uh, these varieties can contribute to nutrition. So for food systems to be sustainable, it is crucial that adaptation and mitigation strategies are nutrition sensitive. So there is need to consider the effect of these adaptation and mitigation strategies on nutrition outcomes. So um, one of the work we are doing at my university, we are working on a conceptual framework that links climate change, adaptation strategies and nutrition. And um, also the framework shows uh, different indicators that can be used to assess the impact of climate change adaptation strategies on nutrition outcomes. And they're still under development, but um, I'll share what we are doing currently. So this is the framework that um, we have come up with and we are still further developing so that at the end of the day, would want to be able to assess the different adaptation strategies being proposed or being implemented to check if they have a positive or negative uh, impact on nutrition outcomes. So um, as you say, the center or the, heart, the core of this framework is our food system, mainly agro food system, whereby you're talking about the issue of availability, access, utilization, stability, and um, including production, processing, distribution, and consumption. So we are saying uh, this, the food system, is affected by the climatic shocks and stresses. And um, there are shifts in average temperature and rainfall conditions, extreme weather events, droughts, floods, storms. Uh, two years ago in Zimbabwe, we have a cyclone, cyclone Idai, which also caused a lot of havoc. A lot of lives were lost. Were lost. And if you, even the issue of uh, nutrition, the impact is still being felt. Then to circumvent the issue of these uh, climatic uh, shocks, we need to introduce adaptation strategies, which we are doing, which has been done, looking at the issue of coping, adaptation, adoption, transformation, and resilience. I know most um, development partners are working on uh, building resilience in communities. But however, all the adaptation strategies we implement or we come up with, we need also to conceptualize them to the context in which we are applying them, whereby we're talking about the enabling environment, the issue of politics, policies, legislation, norms, even the issue of gender. So at the end of the day, we should be able to look at the impact of these adaptation strategies using the different uh, nutrition outcomes or indicators proposed. There are many, but um, these are a few we are suggesting, uh, especially uh, child nutrition, you know, dietary diversity, um, infant and young children uh, feeding practices. We should be able to assess whether a suggested uh, um, adaptation strategy is also what's its impact on infant and young, young children feeding practices. I'll give you an example. In Zimbabwe, some work that has been done uh, or the, the different um, adaptation strategies being introduced, you'll find uh, sometimes because uh, maize is not drought tolerant, uh, yields are getting low because of the droughts, one value chain that is in being promoted is the um, traditional grains. I mean, the, your pearl millet, your finger millet, sorghum. But if you check uh, that value chain in Zimbabwe, it's not uh, mechanized ye as yet. So there's a lot of manual labor involved. And you find when it comes to small grains, your finger millet, your pearl millet, it's the women 
who are mainly involved and it's hard labor in manual labor then it also has an implication on even the feeding ch young child children feeding practices because the mother will spend more time um, in the fields working on these small grains so it's um those impact of the different adaptation strategies being introduced that we want to look at that we want to ensure that uh, before we introduce an, an adaptation strategy we also need to look at its impact on nutrition its impact on different um, nutrition outcomes so that's the framework we have been working on and we are still working on further improving it to become an assessment tool so in coming up with the the conceptual framework i just presented we used different uh, design principles. Principle number one is the systems approach. I think uh, that has been said that uh, that's why we call it a food system. It's a whole set of different uh, components brought together. So in this uh, framework I presented, we are talking about climate change, food systems, adaptation strategies, and system outputs different components that we are bringing together that we should not uh, look at each other in isolation, but as a system. Another prin uh, principle is that of uh, contingency theory, because we are saying a system should match the environment in which it is being introduced. Adaptation, adaptation strategies introduced in Zimbabwe might not work in another different uh, context, uh, for example, maybe in Mexico or even in Zambia, a neighboring country. So before we introduce or we adapt what has been done in other countries, we should also first assess whether that will have a positive contribution to nutrition outcomes in our own circumstance or environment. The other principle is that of system output, as I indicated, we need to have measurables um, for us to be able to assess the impact of an intervention strategy on nutrition outcomes for us to build sustainable food systems. So several indicators have been suggested and also many more can be added. So that's um, basically what um, we are working on also from the angle of climate change and nutrition nexus. That food systems, it's a complex uh, um, uh, system which uh, for us to work towards sustainable food systems, we also need to look at the different adaptation strategies that we are advocating, that we are implementing, as in what's the impact on nutrition. Maybe on food security, maybe on uh, production output, it might be a very viable, very good uh, adaptation strategy, but what's the impact of that strategy on nutrition outcomes? That we should also put that high on the agenda. In conclusion, um, it will be the issue of the linkage between climate change, adaptation strategy, and nutrition security is much, very much complex. So besides only talking about climate smart uh, adaptations, we should also look at the, the if they are nutrition sensitive. We, they have to be nutrition sensitive for us to achieve uh, sustainable food systems. And uh, the concept, conceptual framework I've just presented, uh, presented can be used as a guide in selecting and identifying more suitable climate adaptation strategies given specific contextual environment. And also future work, as I said, we are further developing this concept, conceptual framework I presented into it, an assessment tool whereby we have various indicators and we, are, we should be able to assess uh, uh, using that to whether a suggested or identified adaptation strategy is nutrition sensitive or has positive nutrition and result in positive nutrition outcomes. So basically that's um, the work uh, we are doing at Marina University as a way of contributing towards uh, sustainable food systems. I thank you for listening and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. I think it was very important, uh, your focus on the principles used uh, in developing this framework for establishing a linkage between climate change, uh, the adaptation strategies and nutrition security. Uh, it is indeed a very complex matter and should be translated into a more operative assessment tool. Uh, as you will notice, there is uh, quite a few uh, questions also for you in the Q&A box. So, start having a look you can select a few that you can answer live during the q a moment later and you can also start typing your answer to some of the questions 
Um, I now give the floor to our third speaker, Mr. Tonde Matsungo from the University of Zimbabwe uh, with this presentation on nutrition, agriculture and COVID-19 nexus, food systems for healthier diets. Tonde, the floor is yours. Uh, you have 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for you. Um, Leslie, can you stop uh, sharing? Yeah, please, Leslie, can you stop sharing? Thanks. Thank you. Okay, now you can go ahead and share your screen. Great. Okay, thank you, um, Leslie and Dia for uh, the presentations and uh, Fabio, thank you for uh, uh, steering the ship. So I'm Tonde Matsungo, um, a nutritionist um, a practitioner from Zimbabwe. I'm going to take you through this uh, topic where I'm going to be um, discussing um, the elephant in the room is the world um, uh, gears towards um, uh, food systems transformation. Um, the elephant in the room is COVID-19. Uh, it happened uh, starting in, uh, um, it has had in 2019 and it's still with us. So I'm going to be uh, looking at this topic and um, from an agriculture and nutrition lens. So this is the presentation outline, uh, brief background. Uh, then I will also briefly zero on to the food system summit. Uh, the action tracks and also then um, uh, share with you pointers of some of the reading materials that uh, you can find online uh, in the evidence that is available highlighting the impact of COVID-19 uh, on, on, on food system. So I call it an elephant in the room because there's been a lot of disruption brought about by the pandemic. Of course, like what previous speakers have said, uh, it brought its challenges, but it also um, uh, brought opportunities. Uh, and uh, in the context of the uh, um, um, uh, Food Systems Summit and the uh, 2030 Sustainable Development Goals Agenda, it's also an opportunity in 2021 to renew uh, some of the commitments uh, and the reboot um, efforts by national governments and um, organizations towards uh, eliminating hunger and all forms of malnutrition by uh, 2030. So as background, uh, the summit, is, uh, UN um, uh, Food System Summit is going to be happening this year. It's a big event, they must attend. Um, it's also dubbed the People Summit, the Solution Summit. Um, and the broad objective is rightly summarized by the UN Special uh, Envoy, Dr. Agnes Kalibata, um, who said in that quote, uh, the purpose of the summit is uh, to um, setting up pathways and um, finding out new solutions towards um, uh, uh, an energized uh, efforts towards um, 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 achieving the SDG agendas by uh, 2030. So it's going to happen um, under the auspices of um, the United Nations. So to start with, we also might want to remind each other what a food system is. Uh, a food system um, has several definitions if you look online and in other sources, but I'm pointing you towards this document by this scientific panel um, titled Food Systems Definition Concepts and Application. In that important document, the scientists arrived at a conclusion that um, um, in terms of uh, food systems, it needs to at least meet the uh, uh, theory criteria that is outlined there. Uh, but as we already know, it, uh, food systems um, uh, comprises a lot of um, uh, uh, um, actors and, 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 and food value, uh, along the food value chain. Uh, but what we are worried about now as we discuss the transformation agenda, is to say these food systems also have to be sustainable uh, to make sure that uh, people actually um, have opportunities 
um, uh, presented that allows them to adopt a healthy uh, and nutritious, um, uh, uh, healthy and active lifestyles. So that's the definition of a food system. This is the schematic outline, um, also from um, 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 a group of scientists there, where we see the interaction there of different systems, uh, the health system, economic system, climate change that uh, Leslie was talking about is also important. We also have science and innovation very critical uh, as drivers of this tra uh, transformation agenda. Um, and I think that's very important that scientists also uh, come to the table and contribute towards uh, generating evidence that uh, ensures that the transformation agenda is uh, proceeding from an informed uh, perspective. And of course, we know um, a food system is inter uh, interacts and also influenced by other systems, um, ultimately also having a bearing on uh, nutrition and food security uh, outcome. So the, this is the global perspective. We know we have uh, many challenges. Uh, Leslie has already spoken to issues of climate change and how it's also affecting um, our efforts to ensure that ev every household is food secure, um, also linked to losses of biodiversity and environmental issues. Um, Nutrition-wise, we also have the dual burden of uh, malnutrition still among us and the number one challenge that we also have to address. But then in 2019, 2020, COVID-19 also happened. And it causes a lot of um, uh, changes in terms of a global focus um, um, uh, on in, in, and efforts to try and um, address the global or planetary change. Uh, the food system uh, in different contexts can also be a victim or a culprit. We know climate change that Leslie has already spoken to um, uh, again, um, uh, is, is a food system can be victim to climate change. Uh, and in the context of COVID-19, the disruptions also means that our food systems are also victims to this uh, global pandemic. But in, in some instances, um, uh, it can also be um, a culprit where, uh, for example, it also contributes to increases in the global um, uh, warming and uh, CO2 emissions. So these are the global challenges, but I think in the advent of COVID-19, um, it's a, ball, a different ball game altogether. If we continue with the argument or the discussion on food systems, yes, many domains, I'm looking at the uh, uh, food and agriculture value chain. When we trying to talk about transformation of this food system to make sure that they um, are delivering um, uh, to humanity um, uh, better nutrition and, and better health uh, options. We realize that there is an interface at the food security um, nexus where um, all these efforts of trying to transform our food systems to make sure that we deal with elimination of food insecurity. And at the same time, this uh, uh, food system and the food environment also has to be supportive uh, for the adoption of uh, health eating, consumption of fruits and vegetables, for example. So yeah, that's uh, the transformation that is, um, um, the, all organizations globally are also pushing along uh, to make sure that um, uh, we have uh, the systems responding uh, to uh, societal need. But as Harder, Francis Harder has highlighted, uh, we have to proceed with this transformation agenda, uh, also guided by the fact, understanding that we also have differences um, in terms of how we are going to approach this in different contexts. I'm happy um, uh, to say that in preparation for the uh, Global Food System Summit, there have been uh, discussions and um, uh, going on in different contexts, uh, continent-wide and also national dialogues uh, that are going on so that the solutions or recommendations that are going to come up are also uh, context-specific in the work uh, in particular environment. So there's been um, 
uh, some um, publication reports that have come out that um, are also trying to uh, summarize the current evidence as it re refers to the impact of COVID-19 on, on food systems. In 2020, uh, the state of the food uh, and nutrition in the world uh, report uh, also then prioritized the agenda of uh, transforming food systems for um, affordable and healthy attack. We still keep asking behind, at the back of our minds, um, what could be the role uh, or the impact of COVID-19 on um, the global or planetary efforts uh, to transform our, our food system so that they are also healthy. In 2021, again, we had another a recent uh, uh, a report um, uh, looking at the global um, uh, report on food crisis, um, which uh, is also another important uh, to read the report um, um, uh, uh, for colleagues. Uh, we, we realize that this, if you try and summarize what is in that report, uh, they clearly state and outline that um, uh, in that report that our efforts to achieve the 2030 uh, um, goals and targets um, uh, be, uh, after the advent of COVID-19 has greatly been confounded and disrupted, and we need to re-energize, re-strategize to make sure that we um, uh, uh, remain on course to achieve uh, the global uh, nutrition and health target. So if you look at um, that report again, uh, as summary, it tells us that um, about 155 million people from 55 countries uh, were suffering um, uh, food insecurity, um, I think be beyond above the IPC. Uh, uh, class three. And if you look at some of the drivers um, uh, in the tweet uh, from the Global Nutrition uh, 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 Report, we realize, of course, there's climate change, there's conf conflicts uh, which are disrupting efforts, but there's also now a, a biggest elephant in the room, also COVID-19, uh, <coughs> which is having a lot of disruptions uh, on these efforts to attain our, our nutrition objective. Uh, Agra uh, also uh, have produced a lot of um, reports, uh, information, uh, trying to synthesize and summarize evidence on the impact of COVID-19 on um, um, our, our local food system. So we realize there's been a lot of disruption, uh, especially on the availability and access dimensions of food security uh, that is compounding uh, efforts uh, to uh, for by governments uh, to make sure that every household um, is uh, food secure and um, uh, that we reduce the prevalence of um, the prevailing mal malnutrition and uh, micronutrient deficient statistics. So yes, um, Agra uh, has given us that report. Going back to the summit. Um, which has five traits, um, track number one to number five, which are not really separate um, um, uh, uh, entities, but we have to understand that these are interrelated components of food system, um, two, two interrelated um, uh, that they cannot be treated alone. So there are action tracks one to five. Um, and the first one is one that looks at uh, ensuring that they save access to safe and nutritious food for all. Uh, and our food systems have to deliver on that um, uh, and also address the other four objectives. And we still continue to ask as we try and um, synthesize and summarize uh, the global evidence and recommendations to, so towards achieving the 2030 uh, goals and targets. Uh, COVID-19 still uh, uh, keeps coming up. What is the impact of COVID-19 on uh, uh, this um, uh, global uh, objective? So the food system dimensions, six of them, but if you look at this diagram, it tells us that the food access dimension is the one that is hugely have been impacted by COVID-19. 
there is a dis disruption in supply chain um, um, uh, and also uh, a lot of supply issues that uh, makes households um, impossible for households to access safe, uh, health and nutritious uh, food option. AGRA also has their own conceptual framework which they have summarized. And if you look at it, there's also a lot of uh, interconnections, um, a reminder that the food system is not existing alone, but it also interacts with other economic, uh, social protection, environment systems um, uh, to um, ultimately have a bearing on our objective um, uh, of ensuring food uh, security uh, for all. So this slide summarizes some of the evidence um, in African context, um, um, at, at value chain, regional, and also at the various levels. Um, production has been affected, supply chain has been affected, um, uh, and uh, at the end, we realize that um, um, availability and access components uh, of uh, food security has been compromised. And also important, uh, even the diet quality, there's also evidence pointing towards um, a, a decrease in the diet quality of what are people are consuming during the lockdowns uh, in some settings. And in terms of the policy response from government, uh, most of the policy response in that figure, you realize they were um, uh, aimed at reducing contamination or transmission of COVID-19 and ignoring some of the important uh, aspects of uh, stimulating um, uh, uh, food production, for example. So this is the evidence that is coming. Uh, from the AGRA report. We also have the IFPRI report, um, which um, our colleagues can also look into. Uh, it also has a, uh, focused on, uh, on COVID-19 and, um, and efforts uh, towards transforming food systems in the context of COVID-19 and, and the other topics. If that report, I think two days ago, there was an Africa virtual launch that, that happened, lots of discussions, but the message remains the same. Um, COVID-19 has affected national and global food systems, and um, um, there's an impact on um, uh, the, the efforts by government uh, and um, governments to try and ensure that uh, um, uh, they deal with uh, food, issues of uh, food insecurity. And um, if you look at the most vulnerable, uh, the poor, uh, especially in urban areas, this has been the mostly uh, affected uh, by COVID-19. And um, chapter one summarizes uh, some of the transformation elements um, that have to be focused on. But the message remains the same. The pandemic has disrupted um, our food systems, affecting our production, our supply chain issues, uh, even up, up to issues of, of, of consumption where the diets that individuals are also consuming. But in the report, they also real, uh, point out clearly in the recommendation that we also should take COVID-19 uh, pandemic impacts as an opportunity uh, to also um, ride on the transformation agenda uh, for our food system. So that's the framework, uh, ultimately COVID-19 uh, if no action is taken, is actually leading to increased poverty and food insecurity. And governments and partners have to come on board to make sure these uh, 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 dynamics or dimensions or drivers uh, are dealt with. So it's now even difficult to deal with the problem of uh, poverty that is inherent in Africa, for example, uh, in the context of uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, Sorry, Tony, can you please wrap up a little bit? Uh, otherwise, we have no time for our last uh, speaker, but thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This is actually very interesting and useful. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm. So this slide talks about the importance of our traditional food systems as we try to build resilience of communities to react to future um, threats like COVID-19. We need to ride on our traditional indigenous food systems um, um, which supplies us with the nutritious food options um, that can be utilized. Uh, Leslie has already talked to the issues of climate change, but yes, COVID-19, the message, underlying message there is that it's the compounding poverty uh, and uh, food insecurity in the world. And uh, 
This calls for a multi-sectoral response because the problems of malnutrition are um, this is These are the summary points um, which I have been highlighting. Poverty has been increasing and um, we need to make sure that in, in dealing with this uh, threat from uh, the pandemic, we adopt a multi-sectoral uh, systems approach. Uh, I think that's the call for action from the Secretary General of the UN um, uh, that we need to transform our food systems uh, to deliver um, on our nutrition uh, objectives. So I think with this, I thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Tonde. Sorry for uh, asking you to wrap up a little bit earlier, but I think that for all of us, this presentation has been very beneficial since the focus on food systems and the impact of COVID needs uh, an overall rethinking and action on the development agenda, as you said, both at the multinational, uh, international level, paying attention to the growing climate change risks, as also addressed by Leslie, uh, the inequalities and disruption in food supply chains brought also by lockdowns. So it was very interesting to listen to this presentation. Uh, you have some questions in the Q&A, so we won't have uh, much time later for the Q&A, so you can all already start looking at that and select some questions you would like to answer live. I now give the floor to our last speaker of today from France, uh, Miss Aurélie Zunino, who is the coordinator of the ANCA chair project at the Agro Paris Tech. So I find her presentation quite interesting and I'm sure it will be the same also for you as it regards the promotion of sustainable food uh, behavior. So Aurélie, you have the floor, uh, over to you. Um, your microphone, uh, can you please activate it? Okay, I could see. Yes, sorry, uh, I just had a trouble <laughs> sharing no problem, my screen. No problem. It's okay, it's ongoing. No problem, I can see it now, thanks. Okay, very good. Thank you, Fabio. Sure. So thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. So, um, and thank you for the opportunity to give this uh, presentation, which be maybe a difference, but also effect effectively very complementary. So I'm Aurélie Zunino and I'm working uh, in Paris, in France, more particularly for uh, AgroParisTech and more precisely for a project that is called the Anka Chair. And so I will um, talk to you more uh, particularly about uh, through these presentations about um, we we'll give you a feedback on the educational program and communication strategies that we are using uh, to actually raise awareness uh, to the citizens and to the consumer about uh, food sustainability and the need to shift to more sustainable um, system. So you probably all seen those uh, image or those um, videos of demonstration or climate marches that took place uh, through the past year all over the world, showing that citizens are starting to be more and more concerned about the environmental challenging. And we also have figures that show that um, there are encouraging trends regarding consumers' willingness to adopt more sustainable food habits. So I put you here some uh, data from France and Europe showing that, uh, for instance, 33% of French adults are actually they're saying in 2017 that they are willing to adopt a more flexitarian diet. Also that according to recent surveys that two thirds of uh, European consumers were open to change their eating habits for environmental reasons. So there is actually really encouraging trends However, the environmental challenge is very huge and very important. We, we, show, we show it through the other presentation and uh, the need to uh, change is very important. However, we know that food preferences and food choices and eating habits are very hard to change. And while it is known, particularly in the Occidental countries that, uh, that the food sustainability requires a shift towards, for instance, um, to shift to more plant-based protein sources. Implementing those uh, changes in practice is really harmed by several barriers. So you have, of course, the people lifestyle, their social cultural environment, or also due to technical and economical barriers. 
And in most of the time, we observe that there is a gap, a gap between on the one end, the favorable attitudes the knowledge that people have about food sustainability, and on the other end, the actual purchase, the actual consumption and the actual food behavior. So the question here is how are we succeed to reduce this gap and how we could help consumers to adopt more sustainable diets. So of course, there is not only one solution on the table to this complex challenge, but um, education and awareness are levers that we are trying to use and trying to pull to achieve a more sustainable system. And so behind that, there is underlying questions that, like the need to foster greater public awareness, like to empower citizens and also to find means and trigger to improve uh, food behavior. So all those questions are, 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 we are on our plate, I would say, in Bianca Chair. I would just give you a, a little bit information about um, the projects that I'm leading. So the Bianca Chair is a non-profit project that is funded in AgroParisTech. So AgroParisTech is a French higher education and research public institute specialized in um, agronomy, agriculture, and food. And my project, so the Anka Share, is also associated with the Laboratory of Nutrition and Eating uh, Behavior of AgroParisTech. And so our aim is actually to promote sustainable food consumption and facilitate the shift to healthy, sustainable diets by developing and designing innovative and playful, scientifically robust program to help consumer uh, daily food choices. So this, with those programs, we are really trying also to assess the effectiveness and to really foresee if it has uh, impact on the food behavior. And for that, we are trying to identify means and trigger to improve awareness. Like it was all, all, all said by Dia, the importance of the multi-shareholders environment to find solutions. And this is exactly where our project uh, is, is, really, is really about because we are, of course, uh, linked with science, with academic, it's our DNA, I would say, but we also work with business and uh, policy bodies and of course, uh, civil society to really uh, include them. So to probably give you more concrete uh, insight of the type of project that we are um, actually uh, developing, uh, I wanted to talk to you about a project that we just launched last March and that will uh, end at the end of this month. Uh, it's actually a campaign named Je mange pour le futur. So it's a French campaign uh, targeting millennials. So millennials, it's uh, young adults uh, ranging from the age of 18 to 35 years old. And this program aimed to encourage the shift to sustainable diet through entertaining and educational content. And this program was actually broadcasted on Instagram, so the social media. So you have here a bit of an insight of the, of the program that you can find under the name Je mange pour le futur. So it's a program that you really develop end by end with a panel of scientists, uh, researchers that is working in the field of food behavior, nutrition science, and with a team of artists uh, that help us to develop those pedagogical content. So the pitch and the idea of this program is to actually uh, follow uh, this uh, young girl that you can see, uh, young, see on the screen that her name is Sasha. She's a uh, a young fictive influencer. She is uh, actually uh, leading an inquiry to adopt a more sustainable uh, food habits. And so she will share, like an influencer would do, uh, would, would do on, on Instagram, she will share uh, the results of her inquiry. So it was the idea to use the storytelling uh, levers to, uh, to, uh, as a purpose to uh, abort this uh, subject of uh, food sustainability. So through this program, I wanted to, to give you more feedbacks on what are the ingredients that we use to develop our program, communication program, and what are the, I think, the features that, think, that I think are a good levers and are quite interesting uh, to, uh, to, to, to have a further uh, information on. Um, the first lever that I wanted to talk to you about, it's more a methodological uh, point of view, but I think it's very important and maybe done to her, but very, very important to me is to really know your audience when you are developing a communication program, to understand their expectations and needs and also their social, social norms, to know, for instance, what are their knowledge about uh, food sustainability, what are their food practices, et cetera, et cetera. It's very important. And another point 
is also to uh, implement a collective construction and to concretely involve the subject in the decision making of the program. So this is what we have been doing through co-design workshop. So one of the feature of, our, of the programs that we develop at the Anka Chair is to use social media. So it could be a bit surprising, um, but actually we think that it's an interesting vector and an interesting communication shell for several reasons. The first one is that, as I said, for this project, we were targeting millennials and it's an app that is very popular. So the idea is to use an app, a device that is already used by the audience so to not recreate a platform uh, and to really benefit of this audience. It's also enabled to reach consumer or people that probably don't, are, are less aware about this, those questions. So to really raise awareness uh, to numerous amount of people. And also, as you can see, it enables us to uh, use uh, various contents, so pedagogical contents. So, for instance, we uh, were using uh, video contents uh, like interviews of experts. We were um, also uh, disseminate information from literature through infography or through, through data. And also uh, through the Instagram program, we have the ability to uh, develop pools. So it's very useful actually to uh, have a good image, a good picture, for instance, of the food behavior of the community that is following us and to uh, have also retrieve information about the knowledge that they have about food sustainability. So on a research point of view, it's really interesting and interesting data to collect. And also in social media, there is the social words. So it's really also very interesting uh, because of course this, uh, this media enable and facilitates peer-to-peer -peer exchange. So it's also on a research point of view, very interesting. And another point that we have noticed while we were doing um, audits and interviews with the panels, uh, with the, the audience before implementing the, the program, we actually show that sometimes uh, going through sustainable change or going through um, food behavior change can be a bit challenging and you can be a bit judged by your entourage, by your family and friends. So, being in this program to be, uh, it, it sounds like they are a bit in a community, community belonging to a community where they could, the community that is going through the same inquiry and the same question. So it's also a good lever to accompany the, the individuals. Another uh, very important thing that we are really, uh, that, that are very, very important to, to us and that really are part of the DNA of the programs that we are developing is to non, to, to do not have an injunctive discourses and to really focus um, the program on concrete solution. So focusing on positive message where food pleasure is really at core, is really an emphasis, is really an interesting settlement. We know that particularly in Occidental countries, sustainable food could be seen by some consumer by, um, by some, some things that is more restrictive, less palatable, and also more expensive and disruptive in a way, because one of the main recommendations, for instance, is to reduce meat. So people have the feeling that they have something in less in their plate. So it's really to show and to send the message that food sustainability could also be uh, an opportunity to rediscover the pleasure of quality, to open to new food and to new taste. And so one of the, the assets of the program is to also propose concrete solution and daily life solutions, uh, feasible solutions, landmarks. So that's why, for, for instance, we are sharing tips and recipes particularly uh, to encourage the consumption of pulses or legumes that are not very consumed in France or at least not enough. And also to turn back also to seasonal vegetables that probably people didn't have uh, the ability to cook them or that was, were not in their food repertoire. So it's also to give them some insight and to give them some advice and not just to deliver the message, eat pulses or eat vegetables, but to really give them uh, practical advice to apply in their daily life. Um, I will probably skip that if the time is uh, consuming. Um, also, um, something that I wanted to share with you is that uh, this program will, will have an assessment because uh, the idea is to see if it has some impacts. 
So we are actually implementing a long longitudinal study that will um, give us, for instance, some um, ideas of do the message that we have been uh, passing through this program has been retained by the, by the audience? Do we observe change in individuals' attitudes towards sustainable foods? And do we see actually uh, that these intentions are turned into action? So we will expect the results uh, this fall. And to wrap up, I wanted to, to, to share three, three messages that are uh, important. I think is that when you are uh, designing an uh, educational program, communication program, I think it's very important to identify the barriers of your audience because it's very important to make those changes acceptable. And for that, it's very important to know the audience and to co-design co the action. And the third point that I wanted to share, something that uh, was a lot of a thing uh, for me lately, was that to know that uh, to shift to more, the shift to more sustainable food system cannot solely rely on individual consumer choices. We have to pay attention and have a certain balance while we are developing education program to not to put to not put too much burden on the shoulder of the consumer. Of course, their individual acts have uh, it was it was um, uh, said in the literature that it has an important uh, impact on the food carbon. So reducing their to shifting to more sustainable diet is very important. But we can notice sometimes that. Um, to put too much emphasis on the individual uh, choices could have also the opposite effect and lead to rejection of the action and lead also to, um, to a sort of a, a, guilty, a guilty tripping. So it's, I think, something that is always interesting to, to have in mind and to, to have a balance. So thank you very much for, uh, for your attention and don't hesitate if you have any question. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Aurelie. Uh, the focus on how to adopt uh, more sus sustainable diets was extremely important, and it was interesting to discover the role of ANCA chair and to learn more about your mission and uh, through the case study that you presented. Thank you very much. Uh, there are a few questions also for you in the Q&A. Uh, unfortunately, we won't have uh, much time uh, for that. Uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes until the end of the webinar. So uh, can you stop sharing the screen for a moment? So I will, first of all, share the list of uh, the related e-learning courses. Um, okay, I'm sharing the list. Can you please see it? Can you confirm? Great, yes. so th this is the list that I have been writing also in the chat. These are all the uh, FAO learning courses available uh, as a, a global public good in our website. I have been sharing the links also uh, in the chat box, but we will send it, them to you also via email. So you can check uh, the chat box uh, for the links. I will send once again uh, the link also to uh, the space where we will upload the recording and the various presentations and Q&A. But for the time being, let me go back to Dia uh, as we want to have a first round of answers to uh, to the questions. There won't be much time for all of them, but you will find all questions and answers in the Q&A box that we will prepare after, afterwards. So, Dia, you can select one question that you want to answer live, and then I will ask to Leslie, Tonde, and Aurelie to do the same. So we go in the same order with one question, then if we have more time, we can do another round. So over to you, Dia. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I think there was one question from Demri whether or not the e-learning courses are free for all countries. I think, yes, it's wherever you have access to internet, you can download the e-learning um, courses. But the current requirement, I think you need to have a window. Um, and there was one question on that, um, which uh, Fabio will respond if we have plan for, for iOS and other, other, other. So Ethiopia not in the roadmap, all the countries are potentially in the roadmap, but we have started a process. Um, in fact, Ethiopia is one of the countries where we are planning to have to one of the second based also on the request from countries as well as um, opportunities. Over. Thank you so much, Dia. Just to add on what you just said, uh, yes, the courses are actually uh, usable and visible also from a Mac computer, so not just from Windows. So this is just to clarify on this aspect. Uh, and with any further ado, I go to Leslie for the question you selected. 
uh, Fabio. So there's a question from Michael um, Fredman, who was talking, uh, asking whether in Zimbabwe, the introduction of um, orange flaked sweet potato is a strategy that we are considering. And it's, um, the answer is yes. Uh, in Zimbabwe, through Harvest Plus, they launched um, on the 13th of April of this year, they launched the orange freight sweet potato program. So um, that's one value chain which um, contributes positively to nutrition outcomes. And also the variety is uh, drought um, tolerant. Uh, so biofortification has been a strategy used in Zimbabwe uh, to circumvent the impact of uh, climate change. And on the other hand, have, it's an other strategy that have um, that has um, positive nutrition outcomes. In Zimbabwe, we have launched uh, previously through Harvest Plus again, they, lo they launched the or uh, orange maize, which is um, vitamin A biofortified. It was excess six. There's also um, iron fortified um, sugar beans. Now the orange flaked sweet potatoes. So biofortification is one strategy, adaptation strategy that has positive um, nutritional impact. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Leslie. Uh, Tonde, uh, do you want to answer to one or two questions? Yes, uh, thank you, Fabio. Uh, I have a, a question from Monica Tatsa. She was asking about the link between soil and nutrition and, and also um, um, and the nutrition, nutrition indicators for uh, by humans. Yes, so I think the question was whether I agree whether there is a link. Uh, I think there's growing evidence that um, there could be linkages between uh, soil uh, micronutrient profile and also the forage um, uh, um, uh, 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 mic uh, nutrient profile as, uh, as well as um, the uh, micronutrient status of inhabitants of that area. So yes, I agree to um, that notion, but there's still building evidence on that. Over. Thank you, Tonde. Uh, Aurelie, maybe there is time for one or two answers also from you. Uh, yes, of course. Um, there were um, a question that I was not typing. Uh, it was about the, the program, uh, how do we measure the impact and the results? So I talked about it, but very, very briefly. Um, actually, so we are doing a longitudinal study that uh, will actually follow uh, 20 persons. So it's a small panel, 20 persons. Um, uh, so it's mostly a social um, assessment. And so it's longitudinal. So we will uh, follow them from the beginning of the program, during the program and after the program. And it's based mostly on uh, interviews, face-to-face -face interviews, and also focus group uh, methods that will be used. Uh, we also retrieve uh, some information from the platform, from Instagram platform. So we have different statistics, demographic statistics, but also some figures like the number of likes of the posts, like the impressions of the post, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Instagram's data also enable to have uh, some uh, interesting feature to know more, for instance, what, what type of content was the most uh, efficient, uh, what type of, com of content that received the most uh, comments, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank you, Aurelie. Thank you, speakers, for your excellent presentations and for answering to a few questions. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time for answering to all of them, but let me just reassure the participants that we will uh, provide a detailed Q&A document uh, at the link that I have shared recently in the chat. So there we will upload the comprehensive question and answers document with all uh, questions and answers that have been done during this webinar. So just let me also say that the recording, as I wrote uh, together with the the presentation will also be made available at the same link. Um, please have a look at the courses that I'm sharing here on the screen and that I, uh, I will share again with you. Uh, also, let me inform you, since there were a couple questions about this, uh, and it's always asked also in past webinars, 
um, digital badges are granted to learners who take our courses and pass the evaluation with 75% score or higher. Therefore, I, I invite you just to have a look at the offer of our courses. Uh, you can uh, find out more also by uh, navigating through the FAO Learning Academy webpage. Uh, you can find out about these links that I shared with you. Uh, I take this opportunity also, uh, apart from thanking you all uh, for, the for the participation today, uh, I also want to tell you that on the 26th of May, so Wednesday 26th of May, we will have another uh, webinar uh, on why develop capacities on risk management in agriculture. Uh, this webinar will be uh, co-organized uh, with our colleague from, colleagues from IFAD, uh, more specifically from FARM and FARMD in IFAD. So we welcome your participation also, also for this session and for the future ones. I want to thank again all of you uh, participants uh, for joining this session. Uh, our partners of this series for, uh, for putting us in touch with uh, uh, these academia speakers uh, and, 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 and Agrinium, of course, and Future Food Institute and UNSCAP for the usual support in our series. So thanks to all of you. Thank you, participants, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again in our uh, future sessions. And uh, we, 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 we will let you know about uh, the, the material that we will make available in our platform, we'll, you will receive an email from, uh, from, from us in the next day. So thanks again to all of you, and I wish you all a good evening, morning, afternoon uh, in your country, since these webinars are global. So thanks to all of you.